All right, this is the second video for a push on uh, Thursday, April 23rd. I'm going to go ahead and finish out reading the key concepts for Unit 6 in the, in the um, Key Concepts Guidebook. Uh, I think the last one we talked about was 6.7. We're looking at 6.8. So this will be stuff we talked about a few days ago. Uh, 6.8 is the immigration and migration in the Gilded Age. The industrial workforce expanded and became more diverse through internal and international migration. As cities became uh, areas of economic growth featuring new factories and businesses, they attracted immigrants from Asia and southern eastern Europe, as well as African-American migrants within and out of the south. Many migrants moved to escape poverty, religious persecution, and limited opportunities for social mobility in their home countries or regions. Urban neighborhoods based on particular ethnicities, races, and classes provided new cultural opportunities for city dwellers. 6.9 Responses to Immigration in the Gilded Age Increasing, increasing public debates over assimilation and Americanization accompanied the growth of international migration. Many immigrants negotiated compromises between the cultures they brought and the culture they found in the United States. Social commenters, commentators advocated theories later just described as social Darwinism to justify the success of those at the top of the socioeconomic structure as both appropriate and inevitable. Many women like Jane Addams worked, to settle, worked in settlement houses to help immigrants adapt to U.S. language and customs. 6.10 Development of the Middle Class. Corporations need for managers as uh, for for male and for male and female clerical workers, as well as increase access to educational institutions, foster the growth of a distinctive middle class. A growing amount of leisure time also helped expand consumer culture. Some business leaders argue that the wealthy had a more obligation to help the less fortunate and improve society, as articulated in the idea known as the gospel of wealth, and they made philanthropic contributions that enhance educational opportunities in urban environments. 11. Reform in the Gilded Age. A number of artists and criti critics, included, uh, including agrarians, utopian socialists, and advocates of social gospel, championed alternative visions for the economy in U.S. society. Many women saw a greater equality with men, often joining voluntary organizations and going to college and promoting social and political reform. 6.12. Controversies over role of government in the Gilded Age. Some argue that laissez faire policies and competition promoted economic growth in the long run, and they opposed government intervention during the economic downturns. Foreign policymakers increasingly looked outside the U.S. borders in an effort to gain greater influence and control over markets and natural resources in the Pacific Rim, Asia, and Latin America. Um, 6.13, Politics in the Gilded Age. Economic instability inspired agrarian activists to create the Populist Party, which called for stronger government role in the regulating the American economy. The major political parties appeared to linger, uh, appealed to lingering divisions from the Civil War and contended over tariffs. And currency issues, even as reformers argue that economic greed and self-interest had corrupted all levels of government. In an urban atmosphere where the access to power was uh, was unequally distributed, political uh, machines thrived, in part by providing immigrants and poor with social services. And that wraps up Unit Six. Um, let's see what time we got. All right, we're going to start a little bit of the next packet, which is going to be packet 7, the early 20th century. This will be the last packet because it's going to run all the way up into um, – oh, shoot, I just closed it. It's going to run up all the way to uh, 1945. This will be the last packet you're going to go through for review purposes. So we'll keep it kind of brief. All right, progressive era in World War I. The populist movement dis dissipated but not before raising the possibility of reform through government. The populist successes in both local and national elections encourage others to seek change through political action. Building on the populism's achievement and adopting some of its goals, the progressives came to dominate the first two decades of the 20th century American politics. While the populists were mainly agrar agrarian farmers who advocated radical reforms, the progressives were urban middle-class reformers who wanted to increase the role of government and reform while maintaining a capitalist economy. The progressive movement, one of the, uh, one of the reasons populism failed is that its constituent constituents were mostly poor farmers whose daily struggle to make a living political act activity difficult. The progressives achieved greater success in part because theirs was an urban middle class movement. Its proponents started with more economic and political clout than the populists. Furthermore, progressives could devote more time to the cause they championed. Also, because many progressives were northern and middle, cla middle class, the progressive movement did not intensify regional and class differences as the populist movement had. The roots of progressivism lay in the uh, growing number of associations and organizations at the turn of the century. The National Women's Suffrage Association, the American Bar Association, and the National Municipal League are some of the many groups that rallied citizens around a cause or profession. Most of these groups' members were educated in the middle class. 
The blatant corruption they saw in business and politics offended the senses of decency, as did the terrible plight of the urban poor. Progressivism got a further boost from a group of journalists who wrote exposés of corporate greed and misconduct. Though these writers, dubbed muckrakers by Theodore Roosevelt, reveal widespread corruption in the urban management. Uh, Lincoln Steffens, The Shame of Cities, oil companies like Ida Tarbell's History Center Oil, and the most famous, the meatpacking industry up in Sinclair's The Jungle. Their books and other news articles raised the moral stakes for progressives. Over the course of two decades, progressives achieved greater success on both the local and national levels. They championed, uh, they campaigned to change public attitudes towards education and government regulation in much the same way reformers of the previous century had campaigned for public enlightenment on the plight of orphans, prostitutes, and the mentally infirm. New groups arose to lead the fight against the discrimination, but met with mixed success. W. B. Du Bois headed to the national uh, headed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, in the quest for racial justice. An uphill battle so strenuous that after a lifelong struggle, Du Bois abandoned the United States and moved to Africa. And this is like nineteen later twenties and thirties, I believe. Meanwhile, women's groups continued to campaign for suffrage. The adamant conservative Conservative opposition they faced gave birth to the feminist movement. One early advocate, Margaret Sanger, faced wide opposition for promoting the use of contraceptives, illegal in most places. The movement's greatest success was in winning women, women the right to vote, granted, uh, granted by the 19th suffrage that came out as a result of the World War I women's involvement. Wisconsin Governor Robert LaFoyette led the way for most progressive state leaders. Under his leadership, Wisconsin implemented plans for direct primary elections, progressive taxation, and rail regulation. Many states extended greater power to voters by adopting the ballot in initiative through which the voters could propose new laws, the referendum, which allowed the public to vote on new laws, and the recall election, which gave voters the power to remove officials from office before their terms expired. Working-class progressives also won a number of victories on the state level, including limitations on in the length of, of the workday, minimum wage requirements, child labor laws, urban housing codes. Many states adopted progressive income taxes, taxes that changed – that charge higher percentages for people with higher incomes, which serve partially to re redistribute the nation's wealth. The most prominent progressive leader was President Theodore Roosevelt. McKinley was a conservative president, and Roosevelt was ex expected to emulate his policies. The rumors had begun to circulate that Roosevelt harbored progressive sympathies. After he convincingly won the 1904 election on the strength of his handling of Latin American affairs, Roosevelt began boldly enacting a progressive agenda. He was the first to successfully use the Sherman Antitrust Act against monopolies, and he did so repeatedly during his term, earning the nickname Trust Buster. Among Roosevelt's other progressive achievements were tightening food and drug regulations, creating national parks, and broadening the government's power to protect land uh, from overdevelopment. President Taft and Wilson continued to promote progressive ideals. William Howard Taft spearheaded the drive for two constitutional amendments, one that instituted a national income tax, uh, which was the 16th Amendment, and another that allowed for the direct election of senators, the 17th Amendment. He pursued monopolies even more aggressively than Roosevelt. The Progressive Era is a turning point in American history because it marks the ever-increasing involvement of the federal government in our daily lives. It's no coincidence that prohibition took effect during this era. The third progressive president was Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat who, who had to distinguish, distinguish himself from Teddy Roosevelt, who also ran for the re-election after Taft's one term on the Bull Moose ticket in 1912. While Roosevelt's policies are often referred to as new nationalism, Wilson referred to his ideas and policies as new freedom. Thomas Jefferson has suggested limiting the power of the federal government in order to protect individual liberty. But Wilson now argued that the federal government had to assume greater control over business to protect uh, man's freedom. For Roosevelt, there were good trusts and bad trusts for Wilson, trusts for monopolies, which violated freedom for workers and consumers. Wilson was committed to restoring competition through greater government regulation of the economy and lowering the tariff. Wilson created the Federal Trade Commission, lobbied for and enforced the Clayton Antitrust Act in 1914, and helped create the Federal Reserve System, which gave the government greater control over the nation's finances. Progressivism lasted until the end of World War I, at which point the nation, weary from the war and the devastating Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, everybody's comparing the current pandemic to, stepped back from its moral crusade. The war had torn apart the progressive coalition. Pacifist progressives opposed the war, while others supported it. A red scare heightened the, by the Russian Revolution further split the progressive coalition by dividing the leftists from, moderates, from the moderates. Moreover, the progressive movement had achieved many of its goals, at, and as it did, it, it lost the support of those interest groups whose ends had been met. Some say the progressive movement was brought to an end, at least in part, by its own success. So we're going to stop there for our video, um, and we'll pick up there on Monday.